tonight, the dash for gas. I'm here in Galston looking at an industry which is worth billions and employs thousands. And I'm on the Babbage gas platform, 55 miles off the east coast, with a series of exclusive reports looking at the men and women who bring the gas from here in the North Sea to your home. We'll be talking to one of the companies benefiting from the boom and trying to explain why energy prices are so high. Gas, of course, is suddenly in the spotlight. As Britain continues to shiver, our demand for gas shoots up. And when one pipeline broke on Friday, wholesale prices reached record levels. Our reporter Simon Newton is at gas platform Babbage, 55 miles off the coast, where they're working at full throttle. Simon. Well, Susie, the headlines have been dominated for the past few days with stories of Britain's gas uh, supplies uh, running out. This uh, platform, 55 miles off the coast, and platforms like it all around the southern North Sea are very much in the front line in keeping that domestic supply going. Just to give you one statistic, this gap, gas platform produces enough gas in one day to fill four Olympic stadiums in the East End of London. Well, let's give you first an introduction to the gas platform Babbage. <laughs> From the air, it's quite a sight. Dwarfed by the huge drilling rig sitting above it is the small red Babbage platform, 3,000 tonnes of steel rising 100 metres from the sea. It lies 55 miles off the east coast in the Babbage gas field, one of the largest in the southern North Sea. Spread over three decks, the platform's operated by the German energy giant E.ON, one of more than 150 offshore installations off our coast. Babbage cost E.ON £400 million to design and build, but with gas prices at an all-time high, the returns on that investment are potentially immense. Putford Shore, Babbage Control. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we've got some severe weather still. We're 50 knot winds, 5 metre seas at the moment. 20 so men live and work here, many from East well, Anglia. While Britain's gas and oil reserves are dwindling overall, the southern North Sea is actually booming. For our region, it means jobs and millions in investment and a lucrative dash for gas that it's hoped could go on for decades. Well, the gas they're bringing into this platform isn't, as you might expect, directly uh, below us. In fact, it's uh, from a reservoir which is about three kilometres or so away from this platform. Later in the programme, we'll look at the drilling techniques and the fracking techniques that's allowing them to bring this gas back to shore. Susie. Yes, welcome back to CLS Offshore in Galston. This company is seeing its turnover increase year on year on the back of a boom in North Sea gas. And this week on Look East, we're looking at what exactly happens out on those platforms. So back now to Simon Newton on gas platform Babbage. Well, Susie, this platform is very closely linked to East Anglia. The flights come out from Great Yarmouth, as do all of the supplies. Let's show you a map of exactly where this platform is, 55 miles uh, off the east coast, uh, nestled in a, uh, among a series of other fields out here in the southern North Sea. Well, one of the reasons the North Sea is enjoying such a revival is new technology, techniques that are bringing once redundant gas fields back to life. <laughs> Discovering gas out here in the southern North Sea used to be an imprecise art, but new technology has changed all that. This is what the Babbage gas field looks like in 3D, mapped using data from a seismic vessel. The Babbage field um, it has a reserves of 5 billion cubic metres. The size of the field, it's approximately 14 kilometres squared, so it's roughly one third the size of Norwich. It's um, kind of a long field, so it's 19 kilometres in length. Um, and it's one of the largest gas accumulations in the southern North Sea. And to reach that reservoir of gas, they now use directional drilling. Where once they sunk wells straight down into the seabed, they can now bend the drill, sending it out horizontally along seams of rock, literally searching for gas. In the case of Babbage, the wells stretch out thousands of metres from the platform. We'll typically kick off and we'll try and keep the, keep the curves gentle. So we're talking two to three degrees per hundred foot. It's the sort of angle change we'll try and get. 
So we set ourselves up and we start turning early and we slowly build the, ang build the angle up. All the time we have real-time instrumentation that tells us what direction we're going in, what our angle is to vertical, and so we know where we are. These three wells are where the gas arrives from the reservoir, which is about three kilometers or 11,000 feet below us under the seabed. Now eventually it's transported back to a terminal in Yorkshire through that single grey pipe over there. Now they extract about two million cubic meters of gas to this platform every single day. That's enough to meet the consumption of a thousand average homes for a year. The other reason gas exploration off our coast is booming is the use of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. On land it's highly controversial. Out here it's been used for years. It's called a prop frack. So once we actually create that frack by pumping very high pressure fluids, we actually fill it with uh, this stuff which is called, uh, it's called propant. Um, and we leave that in the, in the fissures and that's, that's what actually holds the, uh, holds the fracture open. Um, so when we come away and, and produce the well, it's got that higher productivity. While the Babbage field will one day run dry, it still has several decades of life left. This single pipeline to the shore likely to remain very lucrative for many years to come. Well, with me is uh, Graham Fitches, who's the offshore installation manager here, essentially uh, the boss of this platform. Graham, thank you very much for letting us come on board. Just tell us, what do you think about all these headlines about Britain running out of gas? Well, at the moment, so I mean, we've got the hammer down. You know, we're running Babbage at uh, full throttle here, um, like we always do, whether it's hot or cold. Um, and on the way out here, we, you fly over an, an awful lot of um, installation, so uh, I, I st still think there's quite a bit of gas to be had out here and uh, we are doing some exploration as well. And you're, uh, you're from Beckles on the Norfolk Suffolk border, you're a local chap. What's, what's life like out here doing these two week on, two week off shifts that you do? Takes a bit of getting used to, um, doesn't suit everybody. Um, but yeah, if that suits you, you have your time off, um, you have quality time with your family at home and your grandchildren, etc. Um, but when you're away from home, you're away from home and you just get on with the job. And it is a boom time out here, there is a, a, a real dash for gas is the expression that's being used but you can see it. That's correct. Uh, well in the last year Eon has spent over a billion pounds in the area. Um, we've got a drill and rig beside us now putting two f wells in to bring us up to a five well platform and just across the way we've got one more drill and rig. Lovely. I have to interrupt you there because no we're running out of time. Well despite that boom there's actually a, a real shortage of labour out here in the North Sea. Tomorrow we'll be looking at that and the future of the gas industry off our coast. Yes, all this week Simon Newton is explaining what goes on 40 miles off our coast on one of the many gas platforms in the sector. And Simon, you've been there for a few days now. What's it like living on a gas platform? Well, yes, welcome back to the Babbage platform in the North Sea. We thought we'd show you this evening the galley, the most popular place perhaps uh, on, the, uh, on the platform. This is Andy the chef and Lewis who's the steward. Uh, there's uh, cooking up a, a white sauce, having stuffed chicken and dauphinoise potatoes tonight. The food on here actually is extremely good. Let's just show you uh, their living area where they relax in the evening. Um, they have a TV, as you can see. Some of the guys here have just had their dinner, uh, and now they're just uh, settling in uh, for the evening. In a moment, we're going to have a word with this young lady, Yasmin, who's a chemical engineer and is out here uh, working. But first of all, let's have a look and examine further the future of the offshore industry. Out of ports like Lowestoft and Yarmouth go regular cargoes of casing, pipe, cement, chemicals and all necessities. Gas was first discovered off the east coast in the mid-1960s, but by 2000 production had begun to dwindle. Now, thanks to technology and the high price of gas, for this industry the good times have returned. But how long can it last? What we have shown with um, developments like Babbage or the recent uh, discovery of Tolmon, they're still attractive fields to be developed and discoveries to be made. And that has been made possible through the existence of infrastructure which has been laid over the last decades. So from my perspective I do expect the Southern North Sea to be an attractive area to invest in and also to employ for decades to come. And you don't have to look far for that investment. Just five miles from the Babbage platform E.ON is drilling another gas well. But while firms like E.ON can discover gas out here, what they struggle to find is the next generation of offshore workers. And filling that skills gap is the key to the future of this industry. 
Lowestoft College is one place trying to fill that vacuum. Here they run a specialist energy skills course and have around 500 apprentice and student engineers, many hungry to work offshore. Some of my family work offshore, my dad does, my uncle does, my brother does. So I've kind of grown up with that being around me. Both my parents used to go offshore, so that sort of drew me into it. Uh, the money was a big factor. It's just, I, I enjoy the atmosphere, I enjoy the people that work here as well. It's, it's just everything about it. But the boom also means employers can be picky. Keely Beresford was engineering student of the year in 2012, but she struggled to get an apprenticeship. Well, I've applied in Birmingham and several, just everywhere really. I don't mind moving away. I'd move away to go to college somewhere else and do an apprenticeship as long as I'm in there. I want to go offshore because it would be a great experience. Lifestyle would be totally different. Love it. I'd love to do it. And of course, there's the money. Yeah, money, great. <laughs> I'll be able to come back and be able to shop. <laughs> The Southern North Sea is thought to have at least 30 years of gas left. Thousands in the East depend on it for a living, while for others just setting out on their careers, it's very much a sea of opportunity. Well, let's have a, a chat with, uh, with Yasmin as I introduced her uh, earlier about the offshore industry. Yasmin, you're uh, 26 and you came to Britain from Iraq when you were 11, I think you told me, uh, and you're a chemical engineer now. Just tell us what attracted you to come and work in this industry. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I finished school. Um, I was thinking about doing medicine or other things that are related to science and maths. Um, and then I got a leaflet through the post from Why Not ChemEng, which is an organization that promotes chemical engineering. And it looked like a really interesting career. So I thought I'll take the risk and do it. And you go into schools, don't you, and talk to young women in particular about entering engineering? Yeah, I do. Um, just last week I was at the Big Bang Fair. Eon had a stand over there and we had 65,000 kids coming in and they were all really enthusiastic about science. So I, I enjoyed that quite a lot. And it is undoubtedly a very male-dominated industry. What's it like for someone like you to come out and, and live on these uh, platforms? You only do it for short periods of time, but it's, uh, is it okay? Yeah, it's fine. It has a very negative or very masculine image, but it's really not as bad as it seems. I, I really enjoy it and all the guys are really nice and they're very happy to teach me. Great stuff. Thank you very much for talking to us. Well, tomorrow we'll have a closer look at someone who's been out here uh, for 22 years. That's Stuart, uh, who uh, lives uh, in Lowestoft, and we'll have a, look, a, a closer look at his life and how he finds working offshore. Back to you. Simon, thank you very much. We like the sound of stuffed chicken and dope and wild potatoes. It's making us you? feel very hungry. Yeah. I don't think we're ever going to allow Simon to come home. He has to stay on the, on the platform forever. <laughs> All this week, we've been looking at life on board a gas platform 50 odd miles off the east coast in the North Sea. We've looked at how they get the gas from deep beneath the seabed and yesterday we heard how difficult it is for the industry to recruit the right people. Tonight, what's life really like on board? Here's Simon Newton. Hello, yes, this is our last evening on board the uh, Babbage platform. Uh, we're in the control room, as you can see behind me. I just thought I'd briefly mention to you about the safety culture that exists on board this platform. It is uh, all-consuming. It is uh, over, overarching and everything they do. If they have a, a safety concern, they can use a, a card from here and they can put it into this suggestion box and it's addressed here on board. And everybody who comes on board at the platform has one of these bags. You can see in this great big rack here. I'll take out mine and you can see what's inside it. This this is uh, your immersion suit that you wear when you come uh, by helicopter and when you go back to, to land uh, from here. Uh, everybody has to have one of those. That also has your life jacket in it. This is where you muster if there is an emergency on board. Everybody who works outside in anywhere that uh, is, is risky perhaps, then they use one of these gas detectors and uh, they have that on them uh, at all times. And over there is uh, essentially a, a mini fire station with all the firefighting equipment that they have on board because fire is the major concern. Well, we've been looking at the lives of the guys that work on board here. One person in particular we've been focusing on is Stuart Purcell. He's 40, he's from Lowestoft, he's the senior operations technician on board the Babbage platform. This is his story in his own words. Hello.
I do find it difficult, yeah, especially being away. My wife as well and my child, I love them both dearly. And that, that is hard to come away from home for two weeks at a time. Especially when stuff happens at home and you can't get home straight away. It's very difficult to deal with that. So what does your little lad think you do? He just, he, I believe he just thinks I fly in helicopters because when he drops me off at the heliport, he sees the helicopters landing and taking off. And he, I believe he just thinks I fly around in one of them for two weeks. primary role in here was the operations technician and the permit controller and that takes up most of my morning and and the crane work is sort of second nature really don't really think about it anymore it's just it's like driving a car you get used to it it's, it just comes to you what's life really like out here I mean, I've spent times in four-man cabins where the bunk beds look like they've come out of a prison. You go in, the shift door is right next to your cabin door and it's banging all day and all night and you don't get much sleep. These cabins on here, no bunk beds, they're just beds, two-man cabins, ensuite bathroom. I try to keep fit as much as I can on here, but you know, you go up into the cabinet, um, into the galley area and you'll see the dessert cabinet in there and all these lovely fresh desserts that you can help yourself to and the fresh baked bread and you smell that being baked during the day. It's, it's quite hard to actually resist the food up there. And I guess the best feeling of all must be going home after those two weeks away. Yeah, the last day of the trip is always best. Just travel home, you open the front door, see my son's face light up, see my wife's face light up. It makes it all worthwhile. All the guys who come and work on these platforms have to go through survival training and uh, so did Sean and I to actually come out here. We can show you some pictures now of uh, intrepid Sean, the cameraman, in that, uh, in a, what is essentially a mock-up helicopter in the uh, pool in Norwich being dumped in there uh, upside down and you have to uh, essentially put on a rebreather which is a, a, a piece of equipment that allows you to breathe a little bit longer underwater and then escape. It really focuses the mind really on the safety aspects of being out on these platforms. Well with me is Graham Fitches who's the offshore installation manager. Graham you're essentially the man in charge out here. One thing people might not know though is this platform in say four years time all these steps won't be here because this will actually be unmanned and perhaps run from shore. That's correct yeah we've been having